Good evening. Welcome to the Barbados Association of Professional Engineers monthly technical webinar for March 2023. This is a CPD event, that is, it is a continuous professional development event and carries a value of two CPD points. Please contact our secretariat to have your CPD information forwarded to you should you wish to claim those points. We have some housekeeping points for this evening. Um, we are asked that you will mute your device. Um, once the question and segment answer comes up, then you'll be able to interact with our guests. Uh, we also ask that uh, if you are a bit camera shy, you can put your questions in the chat. And as moderator, I can ask Pete those questions on your behalf. Um, the session will normally take about 30 to 40 minutes presentation. Then we'll have an opportunity for you to interact with our guests at the end of that presentation for about 20 minutes or so. Uh, tonight's topic, we are dealing with the fitted form of contract, and our presenter for tonight is Mr. Peter Raymer. Peter has 39 years of, oh, sorry, yes, I will read it as he sent it. In the 39 years since graduating from college, I have had the privilege to work for construction companies on the cutting edge of technological innovations in their various areas of speciality, being either building or civil engineering. Whilst working in Southern Africa, South Africa, Namibia, Botswana, and here in Barbados, I have enjoyed the opportunity of being part of the teams constructing hospitals, military test facilities, infrastructure projects, commercial retail developments, mass housing, educational institutions, and airports. During the course of these various projects, I progressed from project quantity severe to commercial manager level, becoming a chartered severe along the way and have enjoyed managing and mentoring staff from graduate to senior level. During the course of my time in construction, I have worked with the fitted, con fitted forms of contract, European Development Fund forms, AIA, GCC, JCT, and the BIA forms and have gained extensive experience in the understanding and application of these forms of contract. I started my own small practice in April of 2019, offering quantity surveying services, cost consulting, project management, and contractual claims services, which has seen the company grow significantly, indicating the need for a large pool of construction professionals on the island and the region as a whole. I personally have known Peter for many years. Um, we, were work, we worked together as colleagues at um, Jada Builders Inc. And um, Peter certainly has been a mentor because anytime I had a questions pertaining to contract, I was able to knock at his door and he was more than willing to answer those questions. We have worked together on a couple of projects and uh, he is the consummate professional. So without further ado, um, Peter, I'm going to turn it over to you, sir. Thank you, Vincent, for those very kind words. I was beginning to wonder who you were talking about for a moment, but thank you again. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome. It's a pleasure to be able to talk to you this evening on the FIDIC forms of contract. For the sake of the exercise, I've limited the coverage to the FIDIC Red Book 1999 and to the clauses particularly pertinent to the engineer and his interaction with the contract and the contractor. So without further ado, I'm going to start a slide presentation. And um, as Vincent said, you can um, take everything from there. Okay, let's go. Oh. Right. FIDIC forms a contract, what you should know as a construction professional. Right, first of all, FIDIC is the International Federation of Consulting Engineers. It sounds really better in French, but my French is abhorrent, so I won't even attempt that. It was founded in, in 1913 and is based in Geneva, Switzerland. It publishes a number of international standard forms of contract. The White Book as the consulting form of contract, which some of you will be familiar with. The Red Book, which is for construction works designed by the employer, the yellow book, design and build, 
Green Book, Minor Projects, and the Blue Book for Coastal Works. There is also the Golden Principles book, which encompasses a lot of this stuff included in these other books, laying down the principles and guidelines for it like to follow. The Red Book has recently undergone a major upgrade in 2017, and the second edition of that is due out shortly. I was at a FIDIC users conference in London at the end of November, and it was very well attended, and some interesting developments came out of that, but for tonight's talk, we'll ignore that, if you don't mind. Right, FIDIC. The key priorities that FIDIC actually put out into the marketplace themselves is to represent the consulting engineering industry globally. Obviously, another aim is to enhance the image of consulting engineers. FIDIC has become an authority on issues relating to business practice, particularly with the forms of contract they advocate. They advocate for the viability of global consulting engineering industry drive excellence in quality, risk, project management, and leadership. And as from clauses you can see in all the further contracts, condemn and, and combat bribery, and corruption, and promote integrity, transparency within the industry. Obviously, nowadays, there's obviously the need to promote safety, sustainable, and resilient development. But they like to promote diversity, equal opportunity, and inclusiveness and obviously stimulating development of talent, skills, and future leaders for the consulting engineering industry. Obviously, without doing that, the industry will stagnate, and obviously fewer people come into it, and industry no longer grows. Right, Red Book 99. Essentially, the role of the engineer is to procure the contractor to carry out the works, and to administer the contract to completion on behalf of the employer. It's important that FIDIC, unlike a lot of contracts, actually has specific authorities and powers granted to the engineer. And as we go through some of the more pertinent ones this evening, you should be able to pick up something you may not know, or you may have heard it all before. We'll have to see. All right. We'll kick off with clause 1.1.2, which is parties and persons to the contract. The contract identifies the parties being the employer and the contractor. And obviously the third person in the, that particular triangle is the engineer who administers the contract on behalf of the employer. Now, usually under the FIDIC form, the engineer is a company. Um, it could be a Stantec or an AI, AI, AI or ACI here in Barbados or any number of other engineering firms. What happens then is the engineer appoints representatives who are normally your resident engineer on site, inspectors, clerks of works, etc., etc. Clause 1.3, which covers the communications, sets out that all the approvals, consents, determinations, notices, et cetera, shall be in writing right? and transmitted using the agreed communication systems under the contract, i.e. the registered mail, pen delivery, and of course, nowadays, most things are done by email. Right. Now for contract kickoff, yeah. Commencement of work. The Red Book contracts all commence on an instruction to commence given by the engineer. And that, this is obviously contingent on a number of things. The contractor has to provide the necessary bonds and insurances, okay, which obviously enable the proper formalization of the contract and the issue of the letter of acceptance. So at this point, the contractor, the contractor gets an instruction from the engineer on the commencement date. And obviously, it's not a totally fixed date because it takes time to mobilize and what have you. But commencement date starts the clock ticking. 
The time, as I say here, the time of completion starts on the commencement date. However, no period is specified within which the contractor has to commence due to the practical difficulties in defining what constitutes commencement. The date on which the works are completed is typically more important than the date they appear to have commenced. Obviously, depending on where the project is, sometimes it takes a long time to mobilize the site. Sometimes you have to ship your plant and equipment there. Often it's not available readily on the market. And that's the basic reason and thinking behind that. Right. The priority of the documents. Okay, and this always creates a bit of a bugbear with the parties to the project. The contract agreement, sometimes there isn't one. Sometimes a contract is concluded on the letter of acceptance. Okay. Now these documents are in their order of priority. So if it's not mentioned in one, it's going to be mentioned in the other. There's obviously the letter of tender, the particular conditions generally override the general conditions, which override the specifications, which override the drawings, which override schedules and any other documents such as the bill of quantities. Now, we could go into that and there may be some questions on that and I'll field those later, if that's okay. Right, once you hit the construction phase, Contractor obviously submits a program and what have you, which we'll cover later under clause eight. But clause 1.9 is delayed drawings or instructions. Okay. And this requires the contractor to give the employer notice if he's missing any information or requires information by a particular time. Now, this is a, a, essentially a precursor to a 20.1 notice. Now, as I say here in this final paragraph here, notice is simply a notice. It's merely raising the flag to the employer and the engineer that there's a possible entitlement existing due to information that's not present. This obviously gives the professional team the time to get the information together for the contractor and pass that over, right? So if you receive a notice under a fitted contract, it's simply a heads up. It's not a declaration of war. It's merely the contractor preserving an entitlement under the contract. Right. Specifically, clause three and um, three point one, the duties of the engineer. The clause in the contract delineates the powers the engineer has. Now, obviously, these are bestowed by the contract itself, and any limitations on what the contract bestows needs to be confirmed in writing by the employer. Okay. There are some cases where employers don't feel comfortable in giving the engineer carte blanche and they often put a financial limit on the value of items the engineer can instruct on. Um, I've never had a problem on a project to date under FIDIC because normally it's all laid out. But, you know, as the engineer, it's often sensible to ask the question of the employer. All right. The engineer has the authority to issue instructions. Obviously, they're necessi necessary to keep the contract moving smoothly. Right? He's also empowered to issue additional or modified drawings and give direction as when and asked for by the contractor. Now, most contractors nowadays operate on a, a CVI, confirmation of verbal instruction. Now, what instructions of the engineer clause 3.3 .3 states in FIDIC is that if the engineer gives a verbal instruction, which is perfectly fine, the contractor can obviously confirm it in writing. And then the engineer has 48 hours or two, essentially two working days to go back and either confirm or say nothing. If the engineer you know, doesn't respond, then that 
instruction is deemed to have been issued under the conditions of the contract. So from, an end, from the engineer's perspective, it's best to give the instructions in writing because then it's clear and there's no confusion. If there's a confirmation of verbal instruction, then there's no harm in confirming back to the contractor that yes, that is indeed what was agreed or clarify what was agreed. Because the trouble with verbal instructions is people sometimes do get them wrong. Right, delegation by the engineer. Okay, as I said previously, the engineer is entitled to employ um, a resident engineer who's on site, uh, clerks of works, inspectors, superintendents, you can call them what you will, but people necessary for the supervision and operation of the works as a whole. Now, the kicker here is that that delegation must be in writing. In order for any of the delegated persons to actually exercise their authority, the contractor needs to be notified in writing. And there have been occasions in the past on projects where I've worked where we've had to ask for this authority. Um, it's not to be taken the wrong way. It just keeps the deck clear of misunderstandings and misconceptions about what's happening. Right. Determinations. This is, to my mind, a very important clause for the engineer. The engineer is required under various articles or conditions of contract or clauses to make determinations. Okay. Um, particularly with things like extensions of time, additional payment. It comes down to an engineer's determination. Now, they might not agree with the engineer's determination, but that will cover a little bit further. But a determination like any other things, consents and what have you, does need to be in writing. The other thing is that this authority or, determ or to determine cannot be delegated to another party. For instance, if you've got a full consulting team on a job, the engineer needs to issue the determinations. The other consultants on the team, if they issue a document, it doesn't, well, doesn't constitute a determination. So the engineer has to keep in touch with what's going on with the consultants that are on his team. Right. With respect to determinations, and this is where FIDIC has changed over the years. Previous to the Red Book, the engineer was not re was required to be impartial. Okay, but the reality of the situation is that the engineer is employed by the employer, who pays his fees. So it can be a bit tricky to be impartial. So. The engineer is only required under the contract to make a fair determination. Okay, He's not required to act impartially. And as I say here in the slide, this raises the question as to how fairness and non-impartiality or impartiality are reconciled. Obviously, it can be a bit tricky in certain circumstances. But that aside, I believe that if the engineer makes a determination objectively, and in accordance with the provisions of the contract, it is a fair determination. Now, the contractor might not think so, and under the contract, he's fully within his rights to refer it to the DAB, the Dispute Adjudication Board, um, which can consist of one or three members. And they're normally named upfront on the contract so that during the course of the contract, things can be dealt with on an ongoing basis. It's not a good idea to appoint this or try to appoint the DAB at the end of a project. It's just far too messy and the process usually will not work, basically because of the amount of material that an adjudicator has to go through in order to become au fait with the facts of the various heads of claim, et cetera, et cetera. Right, the program. Now, 
the contractor is required to submit a program for the works within 28 days of getting the notice to commence. Now, the contractor's programs are not subject to approval of the engineer or anybody else. Because it's a live document within the contract, where the contractor's progress does not meet with the timeline on the program, he is required to revise his program to show what's going on in real time. Now, obviously, there's a bit of a kicker with this where the contractor may be applying for an extension of time that hasn't been ruled on. Okay, so it's very difficult for him to do an accurate program update when he's not sure on what award he's going to get. Now, I know that it's it's a bad habit to actually kick the can down the road until the job finishes and then award up to the time the contractor finishes. I have seen that before. I've seen the situation where claims are just ignored or I've seen situations where they're processed very quickly, you know, and extensions of time are given. But we covered that a bit further on as well with respect to programs. So if you'll bear with me. Right, the extension of time for completion. Right. Again, notifications are not a bad thing. The contractor is required to do it. But this particular clause calls for the contractor to notify the engineer, well, the employer and the engineer. If the work's going to be subject to delay by virtue of a variation, another cause of delay under any particular other clause of the contract, exceptionally adverse weather conditions, unforeseeable shortages of material or goods caused by an epidemic or governmental action, I'm thinking sort of COVID there, or any delay or impediment by or attributable to the employer or the employer's people, other contractors, um, what have you. Now, variations is fairly straightforward, okay? If a change is made, it usually has time implications, which may or may not be on the critical part of the program, but there are obviously, with a variation, there are likely to be monetary implications, but we'll cover that under clause 13, which is the variations clause itself. There are a number of other clauses within the contract where there is a, an entitlement under that particular clause for an extension of time. And just let me say at this point, and I do say it later in the slides, under FIDIC, time is dealt with completely separately to any payment or monetary aspect. And I think the thinking behind this with FIDIC was to keep things clean. Yeah. It was, you know, contemporary records can substantiate a, an extension of time. It's in real time, the engineer's on the job, he's aware of what's happening, and he can make a decision fairly quickly when push comes to shove. With regard to the financial aspects of claims, that obviously is a different matter altogether because there were obviously various heads of claim, for instance, um, obviously on site preliminaries, uh, services being paid for during a prolonged period, et cetera, et cetera. Of these items here, which give rise to the entitlement for time, the exceptionally adverse climatic conditions gives the contractor time, okay, but not usually any money. And that is because the contractor is normally familiar with the country where the work is being carried out, familiar with the weather patterns, has experience there, knows how many days they normally lose a year to exceptionally inclement weather. And it's not normally a bugbear. That can change if an employer delay 
pushes the contract date into, shall we say, another rainy season. And I've seen in other countries, contractors successfully claim additional payment from being pushed into an, a change in season. Okay, Unseeable, short, unforeseeable shortages of material or goods. Well, that speaks for itself. We live on an island and particularly with the world shipping issues and procurement, we're seeing more and more situations where goods and materials were delayed, arrived late. Now it could be covered by force majeure, where neither the contractor nor the employer is at fault. That would give the employer leeway to issue an extension of time without any financial compensation to the contractor. Um, any delay and impediment attributable to the employer, well, that speaks for itself. Um, that falls under the prevention principle. Where an employer acts in such a way as to delay the contractor, well, the contractor is in, has an entitlement to claim and obviously needs to notify as, we, as the contractor is required to under all of these clauses. But we, as I say, we'll get to that a bit later. Right. Contrary to popular belief, the extension of time provisions are there for the benefit of both all the parties to the contract. Yeah. Now, the wording in the document says the contractor shall be entitled. And in the FIDIC guide, for those of you lucky to have one, it states that this is not subject to anyone's opinion. Okay. Obviously, a delay which is notified it is in the interest of everybody concerned for an extension of time to be awarded this has the effect of a giving the contractor a, a future date to aim for but b it keeps the damages provisions or li well, the liquidated damages provisions alive under law in a lot of countries where a contractor cannot get an extension of time for a cause or is denied one it is possible for time to become at large as the term says if this happens and it doesn't happen often the contractor is entitled to a reasonable time to complete the work i mean that in itself is a, a whole lecture all on its own Right, now, as I said previously, the contractor is required to provide the notice stipulated under clause 20.1. Failure to do this will negate any claim due to the time bar contained in clause 20.1. We will look at 20.1 later, but FIDIC, I think, introduced the time bar into international contracts and other forms of contract have followed suit. And it's obviously been a huge bone of contention over the years. And again, that could be the subject for an entirely different talk. All right. Now, obviously, when a contractor gives a notification, right, and puts in a claim, as engineers, you have to look at it from the perspective of was the delay on the critical path? Now, in order to determine that, you have to have a sensible and cohesive program from the contractor. And preferably either Microsoft Project or Primavera or Spider or any of the numerous packages that are available. Contractors have a habit of giving you PDFs showing you the sequence of events. That doesn't show you what the critical path is unless they've actually printed that particular view of the, the program. So as a tip when dealing with you know claims for extension of time, it would be prudent to ensure that the contractor is providing you with a soft copy or a hard a hardware copy that you can actually open up and drill down into to do a, 
you know, proper investigation. Right. Another thing that gives rise to extensions of time for the contractor are delays by authorities. Acts of government are things that nobody can predict. Um, they happen for various reasons, and there's normally a very good reason for it. But I don't believe any contractor or a construction professional is clairvoyant. So FIDIC look at this and they say that, okay, under clause eight, only expected time is right. There's no dimension of additional payment. Now, obviously, that's something that needs to be discussed with the engineer as and when events like this take place. Right. Where the contractor is not maintaining his rate of progress as per his program, okay, the engineer can, under clause 8.6, instruct the contractor to update and reissue his program. Okay. There is one condition which prevents that. Okay. And that's in the clause 8.4. If the contractor has lodged an extension of time claim and it hasn't been addressed by the engineer, the engineer is not empowered to instruct the contractor to update his program. And as I say here, the lesson here is not to delay on reviewing claims submitted by the contractor. Make an interim award if necessary. You know, at the end of the day, gives the engineer time to properly investigate. And there's nothing to stop the engineer from instructing the contractor to maintain contemporary records so that, you know, it can be investigated after the fact, so to speak. Yeah. Obviously, it's better to do these things in real time. All right. Okay. Delay damages. And this is obviously the bone of contention for all contractors, but it's obviously a hook for the employer. All right. Now, you simply cannot deduct damages from the contractor. The contractor needs to be notified. Under clause 2.5, that contains the provisions for the employer to notify the contractor of the employer's intention to claim. That notification has to be issued before the engineer can withhold any damages in the certification process. So the other thing is the damages can be applied regardless of unresolved contractors' claims. Obviously, the mechanism there is that if the claims are then settled and the contractor is entitled to an extension of time and additional payment or just the extension of time, well, those damages would be reversed. Taking over the works, right, clause 10.1 in the Red Book lays down the procedure for the employers taking over of the works. The contractor can apply for a taking over certificate no more than 14 days before he believes the works will be complete. The engineer, once he's received the application for the taking over certificate, has 28 days to respond back to the contractor. Now that response can be an agreement or an acceptance that yes, no, the works are taken over. Or alternatively, the engineer can reject the application. But in rejecting the application, the engineer is required to provide the reasons why the application is being rejected and has to you know, specify the work that needs to be done in order to enable taking over. Now, this this particular area is fraught with problems because a minor defect to one person is not necessarily a minor defect to another. Um, what you find is that you've got to 
employ a certain degree of uh, logic to the whole thing. If the defects are minor and do not affect the use of the works, then there's no reason why a taking over certificate cannot be issued. Obviously, certain criteria need to be made. You need to have access, you need to have power, you need to have the services, plumbing and sewerage. The, the structure, if it's a structure, needs to function. If it's a bridge, the bridge needs to be able to take a load. Yeah. If it's a road, all the surfacing needs to be complete, all the signage needs to be up, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You know, the application of common sense here is the best way to go on this, I think. Now, tests on completion. The tests on completion need to be specified within the contract. FIDIC don't specify tests in, per se. They make reference to the tests that should be listed in the specification or mentioned in the bill of quantities or somewhere within the contract documentation. Okay. Now, obviously, the employer is the beneficiary of the project. If the employer puts the works into use, and that's also another subjective position but for instance if you've built a car park and the employer allows his people to park on it that's been put into use if it's a building and the employers move people in he's put it into use so therefore a taking over certificate is deemed to have been issued which of course then stops the insurance being the responsibility of the contractor that now becomes the responsibility of the employer, as does the safety and security of the works. For instance, watchmen, security, et cetera, et cetera. All of that transfers from the contractor onto the employer and the defects notification period commences. Now, clause 13. Right, it's essentially the variations. Clause 13 is a variations clause. 13.1, the right to vary establishes the right of the employer to vary the works. Obviously, the employer can change the quantity of the work. Obviously, that's not necessarily a variation. That might simply be a remeasurable aspect. It may well be a variation if he doubles the quantity of work to be done or Bias. Obviously, again, the application of common sense, what is a reasonable change and what is an unreasonable change. He can change the quality and characteristics of any item of work. For instance, he can increase the specification on the finish or decrease the specification. He can change the levels and the dimensions. He can emit work. Now, if the employer emits work, he cannot have it carried out by another party during the currency of the project. Okay. So if he doesn't like the price from the contractor for something, he cannot omit that work and give it to his friend down the road, so to speak. Contract does not allow for that. And that would give rise to claims by the contractor you know, as soon as it would happen. Okay. The, the employer can instruct additional work, additional plant materials or services necessary for the permanent works. The employer can also change the sequence or timing of execution of the works. Right Now, obviously all of these are instructed by the engineer on behalf of the employer. Now, the trickiest one in this particular lot, I think, is the changes to the sequence or timing of the execution of the works. Generally, the contractor has programmed the works. When you then change the sequence, and it may be for perfectly valid reasons, that is going to give rise to a fairly substantial claim on the part of the contractor. So changes to the sequence and timing of the execution of the works really do need to be thought out and given full consideration before they're put into play. 
Now, in terms of variations, the engineer doesn't simply have to instruct, although he can. The contractor, the contractor can be asked by the engineer to provide a proposal yeah, in writing that the engineer can then vet prior to issuing an instruction. The advantage of the proposal methodology is that everybody's in the picture as to what is going to happen, how it's going to happen, when it's going to happen, and how much it's going to cost, and the time implications of that. Okay. Obviously, sometimes on the projects that are carried out, there just isn't the time to do that. And the engineer finds himself in a position where he needs to issue an instruction. Okay. Generally, the contractor has to comply with an instruction issued by the engineer. Now, he's not allowed to delay matters. Even if he, he's put a proposal in and the proposal hasn't been agreed as such, he cannot delay doing works instructed unless he does not have the resources or the materials are not available to do it. If that is the case, upon receipt of the instruction, he has to write back to the engineer and advise him of this, at which point the engineer has to review the situation and come up with an alternative solution. Now, payments. The only reason I've touched on payments is that FIDIC allows for a schedule of payments. Okay. Now, in a lot of other contracts, there's not a lot of definition on how the how this works. You know, simply the contractor puts in at tender stage a schedule of payments, and as these dates tick by, the payments are made and everybody goes merrily along the way. Well, FIDIC obviously was put together by engineers and under clause 14.4 you know it states that this, if the installments are not defined by reference to the actual progress achieved in executing the work and if the actual progress is found to be less than that upon which the schedule of payments was based the engineer is fully within his rights to determine revised installments or agree them. Basically, whenever doing anything under a contract, it always pays to sit down with the other party and try and come up with a, an amicable way forward rather than trying to impose something. It just makes for a smoother running contract. So if any of you are in, in position on a contract where you've got a contractor who has schedule of payments, those payments need to bear some resemblance to the progress of the work. For instance, if a guy's done 60% of the work, but he's looking for 90% according to the schedule, well, the schedule can be adjusted. Okay. Just as a, an overview on this, the general conditions obviously can be amended and updated and clarified under the particular conditions. Uh, a word of advice here, okay? If you're going to make a change in the particular conditions, please ensure that you amend the general conditions. The reason I say this is that if you have the general conditions saying one thing, the particular condition saying something else, you're introducing a conflict or an ambiguity. It's best to, when you do your particular condition change, refer back to the general conditions and simply state omit. Yeah, and then job done. Uh, okay. Right, 20.1. This is the probably most the most fractious clause in the entire contract. Okay. From the contractor's point of view, they think it's unfair that they only have 28 days to notify of a delay event. You know. Um, having been in the contracting field for many years, I appreciate that on a complex project, sometimes you just don't know 
that you've got to delay on your hands because of you know imported materials, long lead-in items, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But clause twenty point one is very clear. If the contractor considers himself entitled, he's got to notify within twenty eight days of becoming aware of when circumstances arise. Notice has to be in writing. It has to be addressed to the engineer and copied to the employer. Now, the 28 days right, starts on the day after the contractor actually became aware or should have become aware. Why FIDIC have this in their detailed guide? I'm assuming is to you know, be reasonable. You know, if a guy finds out about something at five o'clock in the evening, he's not going to notify it until the next day at the earliest. Of course, email has changed a lot of that, so it's quite possible. But then again, is an out of hours notification a valid notification? That again is a topic for another discussion. Right. Now, under the FIDIC Red Book, a detailed claim should be submitted within 42 days of the event. Now, it doesn't have to be a complete claim. It can be an interim claim. Basically, the submission of contemporary records, um, whatever information is required to allow the engineer to assess the claim. Okay. Now, the engineer is also granted under the contract 42 days to respond. Now. The engineer can respond with an approval, a disapproval with detailed comments, and obviously with a request for additional particulars. Now, there has been a temptation amongst some engineers in the past to continually ask for further details. Now, once you have the details, you have the details. Okay. Now, even though the contractor is supposed to submit a claim within 42 days, if he doesn't, it's not fatal to his uh, claim. As long as he meets the time bar, the claim is valid. Okay. As I say on this slide, the contractor's claim is to be considered interim and should should the circumstances the contractors submit interim claims on a monthly basis, okay? With a final claim being submitted 28 days after the effects end, unless another period is agreed with the engineer. FIDIC is quite open for the parties to dialogue and confer and agree things as they go along. It doesn't necessarily have to be a combat combative process. It can be one of, you know, offer acceptance agreement and moving on now the engineer is required to make a determination on all claims that determination has to be in writing and the engineer cannot delegate it as i said earlier on a, a large project where you have a full consulting team consisting of you know mep people, architects, quantity surveyors, and the rest, often the temptation is to leave the response to these things to sometimes the QS or one of the MEP consultants, if it's a, a claim geared in that particular field. The engineer is the one who has to write the determination. And I'm, I'm closing on that. It should be noted that aside from the 28 day time bar on notification, contractor's failure to meet subsequent indicated timeframes is not fatal to his claim. However, the engineer may take account of matters that prevented the proper investigation of the claim at the time. So that is it from me. All right, Peter, thanks so much. Um, Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we are about to go into our question and answer segment. Um, if you have a question for Mr. Raymer, you can raise your hand in the in the forum and I will um, ask you to go ahead and ask that question. Or you can put a question into the chat and Peter will do his best to answer. Yeah, well, now, Peter, there, is, 
There is one question in the chat. So, Roger, I do apologize for not mentioning the silver book. Um, it's not one of the more commonly used ones. People seem to like to use the uh, yellow book. Yellow book, yeah. Yeah, the design yeah, and yeah. build. I mean, you can use the red book because the red book does allow you to incorporate some contractor's design into the project. It's not a problem. Yeah, I guess the ETC tend to like, it's like when you really have hardly any design at all, um, then the ETC, the silver book becomes probably a little bit more relevant. Yeah. Uh, and even the yellow book. Mm -hmm. yeah. No, that's true. That's true. But then again. But, but as, as we were speaking, and I know I didn't have my hand up, sorry, yeah, but you said you worked with many different contracts before. Yes. What is your opinion of FIDIC compared to the, the others? Now, that's the only question I would have had. Your, your presentation okay. was very thorough. To be, to, be, to, be, to be fair and completely frank, FIDIC apportioned the responsibility on a far more objective basis than, say, the AIA. That can be really messy because there are obviously different forms of the AIA contract used in North America. The NEC contracts used in the UK, they have clauses in them which they give rise to really fractious arguments, particularly when there's a smash and grab because under the NEC contract, you can go straight to adjudication if a payment is late. You get an adjudication and a ruling and it's, it's termed a smash and grab and it's just too fractious. FIDIC is, as I say, the most objective of the contracts. It fairly allocates the risk to the party best suited to dealing with it. And, you know, if you've got sensible parties signed up to it, you really shouldn't have many major issues. Unfortunately, we live in the real world and those issues do come up. Yeah, I agree. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Thanks Frederick. very much. All right, we've got a question from Mr. Frederick Johnson. Go ahead, Frederick. Hi, Peter. Good afternoon. Um, thank you for your presentation. Can you hear me okay? I cleared you loud and clear, Fred. Great. Okay. Peter, um, you've just compared the FIDEC to NEC and, and the other one, uh, the AIA variation. Mm -hmm. the, the, the AIA has got as many variations as the JCT ones. The JCT ones are all yeah. over the I mean, there's a million variations now with, with JCT, but yes. you didn't mention JCT as a comparison. That's my first question. My second question is to do with claims. Mm -hmm. If the factor gets into such a mess that he has not, he has not properly adjusted his program to show where he is, is that grounds for dismissing a claim for delay? I would say it's not. And the reason I say it's not is that if the contractor has failed to lodge any claims, yeah, he's obviously creating a problem for himself. But if he's, if he's issued a claim, part of the justification of his claim would be a program which would indicate the cause and effect of the delay event. Okay. Now, that program could very well show a date beyond where you are in the project. Well, in fact, it probably would. So I don't believe it would be prudent to dismiss a claim out of hand. I, th I think you would probably be best served granting an interim extension of time and then reviewing the financial aspect of the claim. And, and with an interim extension of time, you do have the opportunity then to to go back on yourself and say that was incorrectly awarded at the end of the day, correct? Well, under FIDIC, you, once you've made an, an award of time, you can increase it, but you can't decrease it. But you, you know? don't necessarily have to award costs. That's what no, no. FIDIC, FIDIC treat them completely separately. Right. An extension of time is just that. It's an extension of time. But all it does I, is insulate him against, against um, damages, correct? Yes, it protects the, it, but it also keeps the damages provision alive. Yeah, yeah. Because if you but, don't, if you don't issue an interim award of time, 
then you're in danger of the project becoming at large. Okay, but but go back to your your um, awareness of something becoming a delay clause. Yes. You touched upon. Yeah. If if the contract and this has happened to me many many years ago, but it happened to me in a JCT contract mm -hmm. where I saw what was going on and I realized that the the real cause of the delay was was an, in fact incorrectly designed um, retaining wall structures, okay. which the contractor did not take into account, but mm -hmm. which had a domino effect on all of the other provisions for 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 completion of the whole site. Right. But they didn't. But they didn't claim on this. But if the contractor has fallen in that into that trap of not realizing what the real claim was about, what triggered mm -hmm. it? Yeah. Are you? Are you being incredibly unfair if you if you if you keep your mouth shut and you say it's onto you, Mr. Contractor? If you can't actually figure out what's caused the delay, I'm not going to help you. Yeah. Well, my, my my first comment on that was if the contractor's done that, you shouldn't be doing the job in the first place. No, but it does happen. It does happen. Oh, no, unfortunately, it does happen where there's not been a proper pre-selection procedure. And somebody who shouldn't be on the tender list has gotten on the tender list and wins the job. Yeah. Okay? Right. Look, it's 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 an ethics call. Okay. Nothing in any contract says you have to penalize a contractor. There's also nothing in any contract that says you have to point him in the right direction. I would say on the on the basis of good morals and scruples, it would be wise to have a chat with the contractor. Not necessarily direct him to the actual cause, but shall we say, get him to start thinking about it. Yeah, you can't you can't spoon feed the guy. No, you're doing, what you're doing your your client will sue you. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Could, could you just say just just go back to what you were doing before about comparisons? Yeah. Could you could you make make a make a, a comparison? Between the, the standard, well, let's say the intermediate form contract, the JCT and the mm -hmm. FIDE. Okay, the, the, the JCT intermediate form is one of the more friendly forms of contract. Yeah, um, it's a fairly simple product contract to use um, and it's suitable, definitely suitable for building works and architectural type projects. FIDIC can be used across the board, yeah? Um, because it's a short contract, it's a very objective contract. So again, it's, it's your call. FIDIC uses an engineer because obviously the FIDIC is a, a legacy of the old general conditions of contract from the UK. And FIDIC is put together by engineers. And obviously it's, it's designed predominantly for engineering contracts. Obviously they differ a lot to building contracts. So my advice is if you're gonna do a building contract, by all means use a JCT form of contract because that lends itself to the complexity of the job you're doing. The FIDIC contract is more suited to civil engineering type works, yeah? Right, thank you. You're welcome. Right. Thanks, okay. Frederick. All right, Pete, we've got some questions. Um, right. And that's really you, Pete. We've got a whole range of persons here, persons who are experienced and some who are relatively new. So okay. um, got a question from Jalen Stephen, who is asking, what are performance bonds and what is their role in the construction process? Okay. A performance bond is a document that gives comfort to the employer. A performance bond is a guarantee that the contractor will essentially finish the work, okay? In simple terms. It's usually done by way of a insurance bond, although back in the old days, and I say the old days, one would have to go to a bank and deposit the amount of the bond with the bank. And should you not should you default on the project, then that got paid over to the employer to allow him to finish the works. So performance bonds are part and parcel of any major project. 
particularly one with multiple moving parts. Smaller projects with fewer moving parts, it's a choice the employer can make. I mean, I've known a lot of small contracts here where the employer has not insisted on a performance bond or a guarantee, um, but they've done other things. They've, instead of keeping retention at a maximum of 5%, they've increased the retention to 10%. That has a, the impact of um, reducing the contractor's cash flow, but you know, contractors are grown up. If he agrees to it, then he's obviously happy with it. Okay. Does that answer the question, I think? Huh? Yeah, Pete, I've got a question before we get into the others. The <laughs> terminology uh, of using that term, the engineer. Mm -hmm. uh, I know this comes to, obviously this is a French contract and then the French jurisdiction, you may not necessarily have the role of the quantity severe, you have probably a, a cost engineer as you do in the States. Can you uh, expand a bit on this terminology, engineer, and how does okay. it apply? All right. Yeah. This is, this is a throwback to the, the good old days where the engineer was the main man on the site. End of story. It, the engineer is named in the contract, does not have to be a qualified engineer. He can be a quantity surveyor. He can be a mechanical engineer. He can be an architect. He has to be a, obviously a, a professional in order to carry out his terms of contract but he doesn't have to be a qualified engineer you see the engineer on fitted contracts nowadays does very little in the way of engineering per se the engineer in terms of fitting is administering the contract he's making sure that everybody is playing by the rules set out in the contract yeah so right. it's 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 a role rather than the person Thanks for that clarification. Sure. All right, so we've got several questions coming at you. Um, yeah. Craig um, <laughs> is asking, does the FIDIC contract form define the term force majeure? Yes, Craig, FIDIC does define force majeure. Um, it's clause 19, I think. Just give me a sec. I'm not a, I'm not a contractual hot rod. Even I have to refer to the books now and then. But yes, FIDIC actually does as a quite a detailed definition of what constitutes force majeure. Um, with the recent pandemic, now this is causing a lot of fun on the international front in certain circles, and that the the COVID pandemic was not an epidemic as such. So you've got the lawyers and the legal eagles all surfing around trying to find loopholes in, is it force majeure or is it not? Force majeure is simply a circumstance that is not beyond the control of either of the contracting parties. Now, what it does is it means that neither party can benefit from it. Now, you might think that, well, that's a bit unfair on the contractor because he's, he's got people on site and he's been on site longer because he can't get materials. Well, how is that the contractor's fault? Well, the simple answer is, well, it's not the employer's fault, is it? He didn't create the force majeure. He's as much a victim to it. and He's not getting his project any sooner because of it. So, you know, it's the usual story where you have to apply a bit of common sense to the situation. All right, Pete. Next question comes from Raymond Jules. For regular homeowners, construction being undertaken by an individual, would it be recommended for that individual to enter into a fitted contract with the contractor? Would the green book be the preferred choice in drafting the contract? Okay, right. I wouldn't use a fitted contract for the building of a dwelling unless it's somewhere on the West Coast. Okay. I would use a JCT contract for that, or even the Barbados Architects form of contract. The contract, yeah, the, you know, at the end of the day, I mean, using a fitted contract on a small dwelling is like using a sledgehammer to crack a walnut, you know? I mean, yes, you can use it, but if you're gonna do that, you need to employ an engineer. 
right. yeah, to, to actually administer the contract for you. Um, obviously, on some of the, the larger houses down the West Coast, fitic has been used extensively, as is JCT. Yeah. Okay. All right, um, Neil, I see you have your hand raised. You can go ahead and answer your question. Hey, good evening. Um, just on the force majeure issue again, I mean, um, if you had a situation where a client was, um, you know, maybe down to supply an item for the project, you know, whether it's in a building or a civil works, and mm -hmm. um, but for some reason outside of their control, say shipping again, that product, you know, they may have ordered it in time and, and for some reason, then the, that that product is delayed. Um, mm -hmm. Would that would is that still sort of a case of force majeure in terms of not being able to, you know, it's, it's outside the client's control in theory, but it was an item which they had committed to supplying. So is that is well, that I would I would interpret that as a valid claim for extension of time. Yes, no, where 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 the employer is undertaken to provide materials or equipment to a project. In doing so, he is assuming the risk for doing that, regardless of what happens outside. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Now, the contractor would have a valid claim because obviously it affects his program and his planning and everything else. So I, my opinion would be to look favorably upon the claim. Mm -hmm. What I would do is I would sit them both down in a room and discuss it. You know, before it gets down to the stage where it's nasty letters flying backwards and forwards and lawyers getting involved. Not that I've got anything against lawyers, but, you know, it just increases the costs on both sides of the fence. Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah. No, no, yeah. Um, another quick question then. Yeah, I sure. wonder if your early slides where you had the priority of the documents. Yes. Uh, is that... Is that that priority unique to FIDIC or is that a generally accepted uh, order of priority? Okay. The, the reason FIDIC put down, set down the priority of the documents, and there's not many other, other documents list the, the documents forming the contract, but they don't necessarily state that they're listed in priority of precedence. Mm -hmm. Obviously, if there's a conflict in any of Fiddick also says that the documents are mutually explanatory. Now, if you have a situation where you have a specification that calls for gold-plated taps, for example, mm -hmm. but the specification says silver-plated taps and the bill of quantities measures brass, obviously, there's a discrepancy there. Mm -hmm. And that discrepancy would be need to be drawn to the attention of the engineer and he would then issue a determination. So basically, you go to the employer and say, Mr. Employer, these are the three various options that have been mentioned in your documentation. Which one do you want? Yeah. Then based on that, he would then instruct which option is to be used. Okay, and he would then determine to be either a reduction or an increase in the unit rate. Mm -hmm. Because obviously, bill of quantities is an instrument of pricing, okay? And it's supposed to be reflective of what's required in the works. And if the documents are mutually explanatory, it's not a problem because the bill says the same as the spec, which says the same as what's indicated on the drawings. Obviously, we don't live in a perfect world and mistakes happen. No, is that, but is that, I mean, I. <laughs> Most of the work we do here, we, we do use the BIA minor works contract. Um, yeah. Uh, so, and I, I, it's been a while since I've used the JCT contract. Mm -hmm. But is that is that is that um priority of documents present? I mean, it's, it's not in the BIA contract, obviously. No, but no. I is think that, is that in JCT is... contracts normally. No. Um, is it, the it's not only... like a really good idea. It is, and and there's no harm in actually stating it you know in your document mm -hmm. um, another thing that sort of occurs regularly is that the instructions to tenderers do not form part of the contract yeah so right. it's important that whatever's in the instructions to tenderers has been incorporated into the, the, the document in some some part you know either in the particular conditions or 
you know, in the specifications or what have you. Because that, that, that's one of the bones of contention that I've seen come up quite regularly, where the contractors relying on something that was in the instructions to tenders, but not covered within the documents forming the contract. Anyway, sorry, I digress. No, no, that, that's nice. Yeah, that was quite good. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, Neil, thanks for your question. All right, we have another question in the chat, Peter. Um, this one is from Craig. If the contractor reports that he is, say, three weeks ahead of schedule mm -hmm. and experiences a complete delay of a critical path item that was supposed to take place, to take 11 weeks, is it fair to award 11 minus three, which would be eight weeks, or would the contractor be entitled to the full 11 weeks? I love questions like this. Okay. This is not a yes or no answer. Okay. All float, all, all projects, programs have float. Okay. Now, a contract, a program is a live document. If there's a delay on one item, it may very well change the critical path of the contract. Okay. If he's ahead of, on three weeks, okay, but he's got six weeks float. There's no, it has to delay the critical activity. Yeah. Now I'm assuming with regard to this question, right? The critical path item that's supposed to take 11 weeks is, is affected by this delay. Okay. So yes. Where does the, yeah. where does the eight weeks come in? That was the only 11, thing. 11 minus so, three. Oh, uh, okay. Minus three. No, yeah. Mm -hmm. Look, if he's delayed by three weeks and it impacts on the critical path, well, he's entitled to the three weeks because obviously he still got the, the date would move. Okay. It means that the critical item is moving to start three weeks later or its duration has been increased by three weeks. Yeah. So again, you've got to look at the individual item and see how it fits into the critical path. Yeah. Right. Sorry, if I if I could just add uh, yeah. explain there the, the 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 program period was support the the program period was supposed to take eleven weeks, yeah. And before the contractor was able to start it, uh -huh. uh, he was reporting he was reporting that he was three weeks ahead of schedule. So, uh, my thinking is, uh, or my or my determination or rationale is. If, if he was able to start this 11 week critical path item, mm -hmm. he, all other things being equal, he would have been able to start it three weeks earlier. Earlier, but he was not, he was completely prevented from starting for reasons that don't have to be discussed at this no, point. No, that is not start. no, huh? no, that, that's fair enough. No, I know I get a better grasp of what you're asking. Right. Okay. So he is clear. He's he's claimed an extension of time. He said this item would. Sh I'm showing on my program this this extension of time would take. Uh, would uh, sorry this this um activity would would ha would take. I have programmed for it to take eleven weeks, and I am claiming eleven weeks. And my um it, my my thinking is that he has reported in in his construction pro, um, uh, reports at site yeah. meetings three weeks ahead of program. Mm -hmm. So I don't think he's entitled to the full 11 weeks, but no, well, obviously Craig, he doesn't believe that. But Craig, it, it's, it's very simple. If the contractor finishes early, you're under no obligation to accept the works. Okay. If a, yeah. if a contractor programs to finish the work earlier, than the, the project time frame, as in the tender document. You know, obviously in a tender document, say the, the, the time frame is 15 weeks. Okay. The contractor signs up to the contract and then his first program he submits shows him finishing in 12. Okay. That's merely a target program. Okay. If he finishes in the 12 weeks, you can sit there for the balance of the three weeks, twiddling your thumbs and then take the job over on the 15th week. There's nothing to 
obligate you to take in the weeks uh, to take in the project earlier. Okay. In this particular instance, where he's saying he was three weeks ahead, well, fair play to him, right? That doesn't mean he's going to finish late, does it? It doesn't mean he's going to. Not yeah, but, but yeah, but, you know, at the end of the day, he's not he's he's not really. And I wouldn't say you were entitled, but the, the the employer is under no obligation to take the works before the contract end date. And I've seen this happen. Yeah, I've seen contractors finish jobs early, have them all cleaned up, asking the employer to take them, and the employer is not ready to have them because he's scheduled his staff to come in with the furniture on a particular date. And the contractor has had to keep the place maintained. He's had to maintain security. He's had to keep it insured. Yeah. Right. So you're you're saying, in your view, he is entitled to the full eleven weeks, even even if he would have been able to start early. You're saying that he would be entitled to eleven weeks. If the eleven weeks was eleven weeks, yes. Okay. And and I had I had asked another question in the chat. Uh, so if since I have you. What, what would be your recommended minimum contract value below which the FIDIC Red Book would not be re recommended? So, I mean, the, there must be a threshold. I think you had so, so I touched on it earlier. Yeah, look, I mean, rule of thumb, anything below above 5 million, do it on a red book. Anything below, I would do it on a green book, but I would do it on the 2017 green book. The reason I say that is the 99 Green Book is a very, very contractor friendly document. And employers' risks are quite extensive under that contract. Yeah. What they've done in the 2017 is they've made it more to resemble the Red Book in terms of notification protocols and allocation of risk. So, yeah, I would use a fitted green book, but the 2017, not the 1999. That completes your thank question. Yes, th thanks a lot, Peter. You're welcome, Craig. Cheers, thank you. All right, before we go to Frederick, um, Peter, you mentioned in your in your presentation uh, yes. the importance, or rather, that the the importance of issuing the critical path. Um, with your program. Whereas normally I've seen most contractors would just like you said, issue a base program, not showing the critical path. Is it then down to the experience of the contract administrator to request that critical path to be issued at the beginning? Look, as, a, as an engineer or a contract administrator, if I get a program and it's a PDF, I throw my toys out the pram. Yeah. And I get hold of the contractor and tell him that I want a program software version so i can actually open it up and look and see where the critical path is mm -hmm. i mean there are various ways of doing it you can do it visually you can actually go to the report section and you can print out a, a list of the critical path items but as i keep pointing out the program is a live document and during the course of a project the critical path will move it will change mm -hmm. That's why it's so important to update your program. And a lot of contractors shy away from that because, look, it's a time-consuming exercise. And a lot of contractors don't have the staff to actually carry out this sort of maintenance. Huh? Yeah. Um, the contract speaks to, on the dispute resolutions, Peter, of um, a dispute adjudication board, which yeah. should be selected at the get-go. Yeah. Who, who is responsible for selecting those individuals to make up that uh, dispute adjudication board? Well, there are a number. The, the FIDIC actually lays down how that goes. You can either agree on one, where all parties agree on one person to be the adjudicator, or you can have a panel of three. And that's where one side picks one, the other side picks one, and then the two adjudicators pick the third. Okay. Yeah. So that's, that's the way you get a. a a fair panel. Okay, Pete, thanks for that. Frederick, you want to go ahead and answer your question? Yeah, hi again, Peter. Um, 
It was to do with um, periodic payments and claims, uh, progress payments. Yeah. Um, I thought it was much easier in, in FIDEC to, to use their, their, pro, their recommendation, well, my recommendation, which is to have agreed lump sum payments for completed works on the program. So it's quite simple. It's, it, it lets you off with a lot of work of, well, I give you 10% for this and 15% for that. And you can spend a whole day doing this. And it's, it's, it's incredibly wasting time. It's better at the very beginning to say, okay, you've got this piece of external works, this, this retaining wall, this structure over here, lump them together. As soon as you paid, as soon as you finished all of that, I'll pay you for that amount. Yeah, that's all well and good as long as it is clearly defined in your document yeah. that payment number one is for the foundations and the construction of this element, bang. Yeah, yeah. You know, um, payment number two is for this and so on and so forth. What happens is people put in a schedule of payments. They think, well, it's going to take me, you know, so many months to do this job. And month, month one, I'm going to need this. Month three, I'm going to need this and so on and so forth. Yeah. Then what happens is, and this isn't the only country in the world it happens, first payment comes in, and the contractor runs off and buys himself a new Mercedes Benz. <laughs> so, of course, then the next uh, scheduled payment comes along, and he gets that. Yeah. And then he, you know, he's, he's behind on his cash, he's ahead on his cash flow, but he's behind on his payments. He's not got work done. It's a mess. So, you know, this is why FIDIC give the engineer the authority to actually do it. What you're saying about having a, a schedule of payments is fine as long as the work it relates to is defined. Yeah. And as long as it's categorically clear that if the work is not complete, the payment doesn't come through. Absolutely. I just one, just one other, other question. In the JCT, it's very clear as to the, the powers of the architect to dismiss the contractor to determine the, co the contract completely. Correct. Now, yeah. w on, on what grounds are you allowed as the administrator of a FIDEC contract to determine the contract and tell the contractor to walk? Okay. Well, the easiest ones are bribery and corruption. Yeah. If the contractor is fiddling. If the contractor is behind program, FIDEC doesn't give you the opportunity to shall we say, fire the contractor. What you have to do is go outside the contract and go the legal means where it's clear beyond a reasonable doubt that the contractor has derogated the contract. Yeah. But, but FIDIC, you... FIDIC does contain clauses that allow for termination. Okay. Um, but again, that would be the subject of a whole new lecture there. Huh? But presumably, you can write to the contractor as you would under a JCT and basically say you are failing to proceed diligently yes. with the works. Yes. Correct, yes. correct. And he has a time frame with which he is allowed to remedy his uh, lack of performance. Yes. Correct. And if he, fail, if he fails now, you can build your case again if you yes. see it going badly to, to write another letter and remind him that he still hasn't, he, he still hasn't corrected his... his um, his performance on the site. Correct. You, 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 it's, it's like anything. You have to build a case. You have your first notification where you tell him he's not performing, right? And then yeah. you give him another notification telling him that if he doesn't pull up his socks within a period of time, that he would be subject to termination. And obviously, when that time arrives, you can terminate him. Yeah. But, you know, this is this again, if you terminate somebody, in all likelihood, they're going to go and find themselves a very good lawyer. Yeah, I know. It's a it's a complete mess. You, you, you've got to steer away from that. But you now and again, you've got to get the big stick out and wave it around. You, you just yes, you have no, to. No, no, no. Look, I mean, everybody needs motivating at some point. Yeah. yeah. I agree with you, though. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you for your question. All right, we've got two questions coming, Pete. I've got one for you. Um, earlier, we said under Clause 20.1, Claims yep. Dispute Arbitration, it states that a detailed claim should be submitted within 42 days, be, uh, becoming aware of an event. Yeah. How detailed 
or what level of detail must this claim contain, Peter? I'm going to charge you a fee for this, Vincent. Um, <laughs> okay, look. A claim, uh, obviously, in order for a claim to succeed, you have to link the cause with the effect. Okay, so you need to demonstrate that quite clearly. Okay. So your interim claim would obviously have a description of what the delay event is, a description of the impact it is having, because obviously it can run beyond the time you actually put your claim in. And FIDIC allows for you to do interim claims on the same head of claim, right? And then you, within 28 days of it being done, submit your final claim, okay? But essentially, it's just a, a submission of contemporary records that support your position, that allow the engineer to see on a contemporary timeline what is going on, yeah? Okay. And obviously, as in any other contract, the contractor is under an obligation to mitigate delays. Now, I ought to be clear here, that doesn't mean to say that he's got to go out and incur additional cost or expense to mitigate, okay? Right? If the employer wants him to catch up, the employer can always instruct acceleration. You know, there are various avenues open. Mm -hmm. Okay, Pete. Okay, the last two questions for this evening, gentlemen and ladies. Um, we're going to take the one from the chat and then we're going to go to Craig to answer the question, which will be the last one for this evening. Um, Justin Leslie has asked, how can the engineer handle a contractor who doesn't know how to use program software or have the staff to do it to, to do it under the contract? Well, to be fair, you normally wouldn't find that type of contractor under a fitted contract. And I know that's a bit of a cop-out answer. Under most fitted contracts, in fact, all fitted contracts, there is a pre-selection and pre-qualification procedure. And in order to pre-qualify, you have to prove your financial ability. You have to prove you have the proper resources in terms of management staff, supervisory staff, that you have the appropriate equipment or can, you know, have access to the appropriate equipment to successfully carry out the project. Yeah. Now, if you're big enough to do a project under a fitted contract, you're certainly big enough to afford to employ either a planner or have an engineer who is versed in scheduling software. Right. right. Okay. Um, Craig, you want to unmute and answer your question? Yes. Um, yeah, Peter. The, the, uh, uh, I have it here in the chat as well. Yeah. If, if, say, a, a 24 month construction project has multiple buildings in mm -hmm. it, some of which can be built in, in 12 months. And shorter period is it right. preferable to the to the employer to have multiple uh, i'm not sure if this is the term but any old interim completion dates for each building instead of having one final completion date at the end the 24 month okay look this this is this is a multifaceted question fidic allows for sectional completion okay but it has to be stated what those sections are okay the advantage of one completion date is that the defects notification period runs from that date. When you have sectional completion, you have multiple um, periods of the defects notification, right? So it, it can be a bit tricky to try and administer that, yeah? But if the, if the employer wants to make use of the buildings beforehand, there's no reason why you can't put that into the contract. I think clause 10.2 allows for sectional completion. Yes, because 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 if if you don't have sectional completion, then you can't really force the 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 contractor to hand over any of those smaller buildings until the 24 months until the expiration of the 24 months. You can't you know, look well, to impose that, that, any delay damages or anything like that. Well, yeah, but even, even, even when you've got that situation, often the employer will discuss with the contractor about getting buildings ready ahead of time or 
wanting to move in. Don't just remember that if the employer moves in and uses a building, it's handed over. End of story. Yeah, that's the employer's responsibility. But it's a different case if the building is not suitable for occupation. Yeah. 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 But yeah, but yeah to go back to your original point, it would be prudent or sensible to have sectional completion and gear it that way. Because then the employer, don't forget, the employer is entitled to rely on the, the contractor's programs, yeah? He's entitled to schedule his furniture deliveries, equipment installations, or whatever, on the information contained within the contractor's program. Yes, yeah, we, I, I had such a problem um, a few, a decade and a half ago, yeah. Okay, giving your age away, Craig. <laughs> Yeah, thanks a lot, Peter. So you're welcome. Okay. Right, Peter. Well, this has certainly been an informative session, a very technical one for our members. We had quite a few architects on this evening as well. So thank you guys for turning out. Pete, um, we believe in forming good relationships at BAP. So can you let everyone know what your contact number is and where you're located in an email address? Sure, I can do that for you. Well. Go ahead and give it give it to us give it to us Pete. you can I will, I will post it formally later but just just spell it out right now for, for everyone who's here okay my email address is cape.consulting.ltd at gmail.com and your contact number 826-0478 pete thank you so much for your time thank you for coming out and sharing your vast knowledge um I, I know that vast knowledge very well, so I thought it would have been useful for a lot of persons to share in that. So thanks again, and uh, wish you continued success as you um, in, uh, continue to embark on your business ventures, sir. Thank you, Vincent, and thank you to the association for affording me the opportunity to occupy your evening. Thank you very much, Pete. Okay. Goodbye, okay, everybody. Guys. Yep. So this is the end of tonight's session. Just to make you aware we have um, coming up, um, next month, we'll be doing a session on the importance of STEM education in the region. That's going to be on April 4th. And our panelists on that occasion will be Ms. Nicole, um, Nicola Leslie, IT specialist, Mr. Ian Drakes, principal of the Samuel Jackman Prescott Institute of Technology, Mr. Robin Douglas, uh, principal of the Lodge School, and Dr. Claire Durant. Um, so I'm hoping that some of you will be able to jump on on that and let us have an intriguing discussion on STEM education in the region. Neil, you wanted to answer a question before we close or you missed Peter by a, a hair? No, it was more directed at, at the BAP. Um, all of the B, BIA, well, all of the BIA architects members um, will need CPD certificates or would, would be, would I imagine would desire CPD certificates from this event. Yeah. So about, I just thought I'd put that in there and, and hopefully see if everybody having to email you directly to request that. Um, so that'd be we, we are very fortunate, Neil, as you know, that we, we, we share the same secretariat and I did announce at the beginning to, to make it known to the, the secretariat. So um, I, I think Stacey's probably on the call and she would have noted what you just said, Neil. Great, thank you. Thanks. Guys, thank you so much for um, coming online this evening. Um, Kenton, can you put up the poster for me, please? Just to let you know as well, our um, online journal, that should be coming out around May. Um, Ray has had a busy part of the year. He's, he's a, a new dad. So congratulations again to Ray. But just to let persons know who may be interested in um, sponsoring or any aspect of our e-journal, um, these are the various packages. You have the Platinum, which is 400, um, that permits graphics and photographs, showcasing products, personnel services, offerings, et cetera, narrative, contemporary, um, com commentary, sorry, for promoting the sponsor, website links, et cetera. You have a half goal, um, half page, which is a gold package, which is $200, uh, which gives basically the content is similar. Silver package is $100. Um, and then you have a bronze package, which is 50. Our journal of, uh, remains on our website. So persons going to our website would have the opportunity to view that journal and then your advertising gets to go. So any services providers who are online tonight that are interesting, uh, interested in joining with BAPE uh, to have your services um, um, 
advertised, sorry, you can contact Stacy at the office and we certainly will be interested in engaging you. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. And we look forward to seeing you on the 4th of April for our next webinar on STEM education. Thank you and good night. Good night all. Thanks, Peter. <laughs>